Okay, welcome back. We are beginning Unit 3 of the Art Appreciation Summer Course. And Unit 3, we're going to begin with our art historical lecture. And this particular lecture is going to be on classical Greece. Um, so we're basically, we're mostly focused on Greece before Hellenistic Greek culture. And we'll talk about the difference between Hellenic and Hellenistic. And, um, but also keep in mind that the term classical can refer to a specific time period in Greece, like sort of the period right around the Periclean age, that kind of 100 year high point around Athens. But we can also use classical to refer to the um, combined culture of the Greek and Roman world. So uh, just remember that term can mean multiple things in multiple contexts. All right, um, so we're going to start with this lecture by talking about um, just how special were the Greeks? How special was that moment in history and and why? And so uh, let's start from there. So in your notes, you'll notice I have a couple of different um, explanations, a um, economic explanation, some cultural explanations. And I think that, you know, in the in the long run, uh, it is. It has to be kind of like a, a mixed answer, a, a combination of all of the answers that truly explains it. Yes, there was a change in the economic system. The Mediterranean was becoming a much more important part of the ancient world in terms of uh, transportation. Transportation on the Mediterranean was becoming much um, much easier and, and going much further, and this was expanding trade. And so the Greeks being able to control the Mediterranean trade definitely uh, benefited from that and grew wealthy from that. Also, uh, the things that the Greeks had to sell, primarily their pottery and what they stored in that pottery, their wine and then their olive oil, were becoming increasingly valuable in this world. Um, just like in the late Bronze Age, bronze was the primary, um, primary, primary uh, kind of an economic engine to that world. In this world, wine and olive oil uh, were extremely important. But also there was kind of a, a difference about Greek culture. In some ways, Greek culture was very, very old school. They held to a, a city-state, a, you know, kind of a federation of city-states type structure. And these federations were really loose alliances that were constantly changing. Um, but the city-state was solid and an incredibly important part of their culture. And that's in some ways very similar to some of the earliest cultures we're looking at, like the, the cultures in the beginning, of, like the Sumerian cultures of Mesopotamia. So in some ways they were very old school, but in other ways they were like, they were a novel new thing. This, uh, because culturally they um, put a lot more emphasis on individualism and freedom. They were skeptical and adventurous and competitive culture. Um, but there's also, I think, you know, the, the final explanation is just the kind of they were the right people in the right place at the right time kind of thing. With the Persian Empire collapsing, um, finally with the uh, defeat from Alexander the Great, um, Greek culture was able to spread through the known Mediterranean and, and Near Eastern world. And it was kind of like just the right formula for that period. So one of the things we're going to study in this um, lecture is Greek architecture. Um, because in Greek architecture, you can kind of see the progress from the, the more archaic to the classical. So um, here, like the Temple of Hera at Olympia, this Doric, these Doric columns are very, very kind of um, solid and thick. And they show, a, um, and the fluting on them is very, very deeply grooved. And they um, look very very close to the archaic styles that they came before, uh, similarly like the Temple of Hera here um, at Paestrum. But then by the time we get to this Doric temple, the most famous Doric temple in the world, uh, the Parthenon, we we see a much um, a much more a little bit more stretched out and a little bit sleeker and a much more classical, less archaic looking architecture. 
So to understand some of this, first you have to understand that there are three base kind of styles to Greek architecture. Um, there's the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian. And I will be expecting you to know on the test the difference between them. And I will pretty much constantly be asking you to, the differences between them separate from the capitals, because that's the obvious difference between them. The, the top, the capital of the columns, right? The Ionic has this um, scroll. The, um, the Corinthian has these kind of uh, these leaf motifs on them. Um, Encanthus, I think, is the name of the, the plant. Um, but there are other differences, and so you need to know those. Some of those differences have to do with which columns have fluting, which ones don't, which columns have bases. Right, the Doric does not, but the Ionic and the Corinthian do. Which style has um, a frieze versus on the entablature, and which one has uh, triglyphs and metopes? Right, the Doric does. So those are some of the differences that you will need to know. Um, all right, and so another way of us looking at this development of a type of art and a type of culture that becomes kind of like a unique and highly influential thing is to look at the change from sculpture uh, from the archaic period 590 BCE all the way up to um, the classical period so this is this transition we're still kind of like just on the edge of the classical by the time we get to this core figure by the way koros right um, means boy or is a boy statue a young man usually we, we assume these are young men um, young athletes, and the Kore figure is, um, you know, a young maiden. And you can see in this transition that the figures originally start with a very kind of, um, very kind of Egyptian kind of pose, one foot in front of the other, shoulders square to each other. Um, but then there's more rounding, more emphasis on the hips, right? As we get to this Koros figure. Um, a sense of maybe almost like a little bit of movement in those hips. And then we get to um, the classical period and we get to such examples as Doriphoros right here. This is a Roman copy of the famous, we don't have the original, uh, by the way, Doriphoros, which in Greek means spear bearer by Polyclitus. And it was frequently referred to as the canon, meaning that this particular sculpture was viewed as setting the standard for all proportions in Greek and Roman um, sculpture. And, and one of the major differences you might be able to see compared to the previous page, right, is in the fact that in the, the Koros figures, and even to a degree in the, the Kore figure, the shoulders and the hips were perfectly square, right? Everything was just straight across. And here, this figure is standing with one knee bent, one knee kind of locked with all the weight on this leg and then the hips are on an angle and the shoulders are in the counter angle and that is known as number three contrapposto okay and so we had this developing interest in naturalism and idealism but it wasn't until the classical period where that really became um an interest in uh kind of a not just naturalism but a sense of uh lifelikeness, right? The idea that the figure is not just permanent, the figure is not representing an eternal ideal, but also to a degree, a lively, a living type of ideal. Um, but that was a really important balance in, uh, in Greek sculpture, right? Remember, keep in mind that their, their sense of naturalism was not the same as our idea of realism. Um, because if you, for one thing, none of these sculptures that we've looked at have been portraits of models, right? They used models, they looked at models, they studied anatomy, but they did not make any sculptures as a direct portrait of a model. Okay, that's my one minute mark. So I have time maybe just to quickly talk about the transition to the Hellenistic. So the Hellenistic right, world is basically the Greek world after Alexander the Great, great right? Before Alexander the Great, the Greeks were in Greece primarily, although they had colonies around the world, but Greek culture was primarily for people who spoke Greek and were of Greek ethnicity. After Alexander, Greek culture spread 
um, all over the Mediterranean world and the Near East. And Greek culture started to become for mostly people who spoke Greek, but even for people who didn't speak Greek. And even most of the people in this world, whether they lived in the Levant, like in Israel or in Egypt and Alexandria or anywhere in, in these different parts of this world, they may have spoken Greek, but not been Greek ethnically, meaning that you know they might their families came from that area, but they adopted Greek culture.